webinar in collaboration with Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News. The webinar is entitled, In Praise of Life Sciences, A View from Leading Life Science Clusters in the U.S. Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Nancy Kelly and I serve on the steering committee and as a founding member of NYC Builds Bio. I would like to acknowledge the founding and corporate members of this organization who make this programming possible. I also want to thank Alex Filipides, senior news editor at Gen, for doing the hard work of scouting out and assembling all of this information. He is the author of a Gen special report entitled, In Praise of Lesser Sun Life Science Cluster, published this month, which covers New York amongst other markets. The article is posted on our website and I would encourage you to take a look to get an idea of what's happening in life science clusters across the country. Today we focus on San Diego and Seattle, but in upcoming webinars, we will be talking to leaders of other clusters as well. This webinar is part of an ongoing series of online events hosted by NYC Builds Bio Plus. We will be posting our July schedule of events shortly. And if you weren't able to attend our past events, be sure to check out these programs on our website. Today, we welcome executives from the biotech organizations in California and Washington, as well as key pharma leaders from Seattle and San Diego, all of whom have years of experience building life science clusters in other parts of the country and have a unique perspective and some lessons to share with New York City. We will hear from Joe Panetta, President, Chief Executive Officer and Board Member, Biocom in California, David White's Takeda Pharmaceutical Company, Center for External Innovation in San Diego, Dr. Leslie Alexander, President and CEO, Life Science Washington, and Dr. Terry Foy, Senior Vice President, Immunology, Oncology, and Cellular Therapy, Bristol Myers Squibb in Seattle. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Before we begin, I just want to cover a few administrative details. There's a program and PowerPoint highlighting the hosts and speakers for this meeting. These will be posted on the NYC Builds Bio website afterwards. The program is being recorded and will be distributed to all registrants after the meeting. If anyone is having technical issues accessing the Zoom room or other technical issues, please email info at nycbuildsbio.org or send a notice through the chat button at the bottom of your screen. Since most of you are participating in listening only mode, please feel free to submit your questions on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will open up for discussion and Q&A at the end of the program and will address as many audience questions as possible. At the end of the meeting, we will also have a chance for smaller randomized groups to meet in separate rooms where you can open your videos and microphones to talk to each other. You can stay as long as you would like to get to know each other and share stories. So welcome everyone. And now I'll open it up to Alex Filipides who will begin the discussion. Okay, thanks uh, very much, uh, Nancy, for inviting me to speak at uh, today's webinar. And uh, thanks uh, also to all of today's panelists for joining us. This promises, I think, to be a very informative and interesting afternoon. Thanks as well to uh, NYC Builds Bio Plus and to GEN, Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, for partnering to present today's webinar. A little bit about GEN. It was launched in 1981 by Marianne Lieber herself as the first publication devoted exclusively to biotech. Our key reader segments are R&D researchers, lab managers, bioprocess development scientists, and executive management. GEN delivers high quality reporting across our six key topics or pillars of bioprocessing, cancer, drug discovery, omics, translational medicine, and genome editing. Alex, you might want to put it on slide presentation. Okay, hold on. Uh, bup, 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 bup. All right, how do I do that? I'm sharing right now, but let me Go expand. under slideshow. Oh, hold on. Oh, hold on. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Okay, am I, not, am I not? 
Okay, am I not sharing, or is there a? You're sharing. It's just in. Um, Alex, if you go to slideshow, file home, insert, design transitions, go across the board. You see slideshow. Oh, hold on. Uh, left or right on my screen share. On the screen share, uh, you don't. You're you're in the screen share for Zoom. You just need to go to the screen that you're sharing. Yes. And and select slideshow. Okay, hold on. That would be hmm, where is next uh, to animations? Oh, here we go. Uh, slideshow. Here we go. Uh, record slideshow, or what's the setting I need to be at? Just go to the far left and say start from the beginning. Okay, <clears throat> there you go. There we are. Now then, let me. De -de -de -de. Uh, hold on. Bam. Mm. Uh, that's not share. Not pause. But let me get to. Alex. You yeah. Go through. Okay. There you go. Um, yeah, I want to shrink the size of the screen on my screen. Here we go. No. Uh, yep, I got that. And I got that. And I thank you for that. And um, hold on. I'm going to stop it for a moment. I'm running into a problem here. Okay. I have all this, but I don't have anything to show me. Apologize for that. There we go. There we go. There we go. Uh, and okay. Sorry about that. Right. So, shall I move on? Sure. Okay. Sorry about this. Let me get this up. Um, thanks uh, as well. Yeah. So, as I start in discussing our two featured life science clusters today, I begin with some answers to the question, what is a cluster? They come from Michael Porter, the Harvard Business School professor who for a generation has detailed the theory and practice behind industry clusters. In a paper he published in 1998, Porter defines clusters by geography, by industry, by universities and other institutions. In 2014, he joined two co-authors in developing a set of benchmark cluster definitions for 51 industries, including biopharmaceuticals. The authors had said, in order to compete more effectively, regions need to understand their cluster strengths as compared to those of other regions. Jen, Alex, sorry yeah? to interrupt, but I don't believe you're sharing your slides anymore. Oh, okay. You need to go back to the share screen. Yeah, hold on. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Where is that? Here we go. Here we go. Try, yeah, try this. Hopefully you're seeing that. Uh, seeing, we're also seeing your email box. Oh, okay. Let me get that off. And um, yeah, is that, is that good? Or am I still showing stuff? You're still showing other things. Okay. I think if you just maximize your screen, you'll be fine. Okay, hold on. Uh, yeah, let me minimize this, maximize that, and yeah, let me start from, from, from here on, or pick up from here. Jen has helped biopharma professionals understand the cluster strengths of various regions by chronicling key developments in those regions, and since 2014, ranking the top 10 clusters in the U.S., in Europe, and in Asia. Jen ranks U.S. clusters on five numerical measures from public sources. There's NIH funding from the NIH report database. 
There's venture capital funding from the PWC CB Insights Money Tree Report. The number of patents uh, can be uh, dug up from the US Patent and Trademark Office. Their database uh, online tallies up biotechnology patents awarded since 1976 by location. Lab space and jobs come from the JLL US Life Sciences Outlook Report, although for jobs, we also uh, use figures from regional groups. I'll spend the next few minutes highlighting two top 10 clusters on Jen's lists, San Diego and Seattle, and elements of their success that may hold lessons for New York City. For San Diego's uh, cluster, I'll highlight three strengths, its critical massive institutions, its ability to build and grow on its heritage of nurturing innovative companies, and its mix of companies. San Diego has built a critical mass of institutions, not only academic centers like UC San Diego and San Diego State University, but a host of independent research institutions. They include the J. Craig Venter Institute, which specializes in genomic research, the La Jolla Institute for Allergy and Immunology, focused on the immune system, the Rady Children's Institute for Genomic Medicine, the Salk Institute for Biological Studies, the Sanford Burnham Prebis Medical Discovery Institute, and the Scripps Research Institute. San Diego also has one of the nation's longest enduring biopharma clusters stretching back to 1978, when UC San Diego researchers Ivor Royston and Howard Berndorf formed Hybritech. Its contributions to biopharma include the first prostate cancer early screening test designed to measure PSA or prostate specific antigen in the serum, the fluid component of the blood. Now, Hypertech was acquired by Eli Lilly in 1986 for $450 million, but many of their executives didn't want to join a stodgy pharma company like Lilly. So instead, they formed their own companies. Howard Berndorf, for example, went on to found several companies. One of them, Neurocrine Biosciences, made news earlier this month when it agreed to develop three Takeda neuroscience drug candidates in clinical phases and four preclinical candidates. Neurocrine agreed to pay Takeda potentially up to $2 billion plus under the collaboration. In 1996, San Diego city government and then mayor Susan Golding agreed upon a strategy of building up six industry clusters, one of them being biomedical, biotechnology and life sciences companies in order to gain back businesses and jobs lost after the Cold War defense cutback shrunk the defense and aerospace industries that previously anchored San Diego's economy, uh, which is home to the US Navy's largest base on the West Coast. The other five clusters, by the way, telecom, electronics manufacturing, defense and space manufacturing, software, and financial and business services. And in 2006, four San Diego institutions partnered in stem cell research by launching what was the San Diego Consortium for Regenerative Medicine, which two years later was renamed for T. Denny Sanford after he donated $30 million to the group, and it later expanded to a fifth institute, the La Jolla Institute. San Diego has numerous examples of biopharma giants, up and coming companies and startups that gain positive attention in the industry by raising lots of money or developing new drugs and vaccines. Among the big biopharmas, I mentioned Eli Lilly before, you know, three years ago, they competed a $19 million expansion of the Lilly Biotechnology Center, which more than doubled its space. Takeda last year opened up its global research center focused on drug discovery research and gastroenterology and neuroscience. And Novartis says its Genomics Institute of the Novartis Research Foundation in La Jolla on the Torrey Pines Mesa. It serves as a bridge between basic science and preclinical drug discovery for the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research. Among the up-and-comers, Trilink Biotechnologies, a manufacturer of highly modified nucleic acids, and its parent company, Maravai Life Sciences, completed a $50 million expansion and relocation in San Diego's Sorrento Mesa section. The expansion included more GMP uh, manufacturing space. Inovio has its R&D center in San Diego, developing DNA vaccine now for COVID-19. Last week, they made news Award, being awarded a $71 million contract by the Department of Defense toward manufacturing. 
Among the startups, PVB Biologics was acquired in February by Takeda for up to $330 million after the celiac disease treatment Kumamax showed positive praise, phase one proof of mechanism results. And uh, also Lassen Therapeutics uh, earlier this month emerged from stealth mode with 31 million in series A financing. A day later, Engrail Therapeutics uh, emerged from stealth mode with 32 million in series A financing. Next, uh, I'll highlight three strengths of Seattle's life sciences cluster. It's finding and developing a niche in basic research, its ability to play to strengths as a hub of high tech and of successful serial entrepreneurs, and its resilience in the face of a significant setback a few years ago. Seattle has established itself as a busy region for basic research. The Allen Institute, for example, has launched a $40.5 million collaborative research center to create high resolution maps of brains damaged by Alzheimer's disease with the aim of tracing new paths to early diagnosis and treatment. The center will draw upon expertise not only from Allen, but also from University of Washington or UW Medicine and Kaiser Permanente Washington Health Research Institute, which in March injected the first patient in the first clinical trial for a COVID-19 vaccine, Moderna's mRNA 1273. Several Seattle research institutions maintain a focus on infectious disease and population health. The Gates Foundation, which uh, in March partnered with, micro, with MasterCard and the Wellcome Trust in the UK, uh, they committed $125 million in total for an accelerator to develop treatments for COVID-19. PATH, uh, which at the Gates Foundation's request uh, is conducting assessments on some vaccine manufacturers and determining what preparations they need to ensure their readiness to, preserve, to produce a COVID-19 vaccine. UW is constructing the Hans Rosling Center for Population Health, which is still set to open uh, later this year. The Institute for Systems Biology, uh, it's focused on deciphering the complexity of uh, biological systems. They're collaborating with an institute formed just last year, the Brain Health and Research Institute, which focuses on research therapies, treatment protocols, uh, and for neurodegenerative diseases that include Alzheimer's and dementia. Seattle's life sciences growth also comes in part from its ability to play to the region's strengths. They include the presence of several high-tech giants, Amazon with its headquarters in South Lake Union, Apple, which has grown its Seattle offices, Facebook, which has 18 different offices in the region, Google, which signed leases in January to expand in suburban Kirkland, Google Cloud, which has a large campus in South Lake Union, and Salesforce, which expanded into Seattle's Fremont section when it acquired Tableau software last summer for almost $16 billion. Microsoft, whose headquarters you see, their headquarters is in Redmond, Washington. They're partnering with Adaptive Biotechnologies. Uh, in March, they, uh, Microsoft agreed to use Adaptive's immune medicine platform to discover and develop antibodies against COVID-19. In June, Adaptive and Microsoft launched an open access database called Immune Code to map population-wide adaptive immune responses to COVID-19 at large scale. Among serial entrepreneurs and other strengths uh, of the Seattle region, Hans Bishop, the founder and CEO of Juno Therapeutics until it got bought by Celgene, now executive chairman of Sana Biotechnology, they raised $700 million in financing earlier this month. I'll talk about them in a minute. Um, Leroy Hood, the co-founder of the Institute for Systems Biology, a pioneer of that science, developed four sequencer and synthesizer instruments, paving the way for the human genome projects, mapping and understanding of the human genome. Uh, and among the companies, 15 companies he founded or co-founded include Amgen. Uh, Rick Klausner, uh, CEO of cell therapy developer Lyell Immunotherma and chair of Sonoma Biotherapeutics, also developer of T-cell therapies for autoimmune and degenerative diseases, both companies based in Seattle as well as South San Francisco. Uh, when Amgen uh, shut down at Seattle and Bothell hubs as part of uh, a cost-cutting plan that ultimately eliminated 610 jobs in Seattle, 50 in Bothell, and 44,000 jobs company-wide, since then the region has seen new activity as homegrown companies have expanded. I mentioned Adaptive Biotechnologies uh, earlier. The company went public last year, raised $321 million. 
Uh, I mentioned Juno uh, also, a developer of CAR-T and uh, T-cell receptor therapeutics. It was acquired for $9 billion uh, in 2018 by Celgene, which itself was acquired last year by Bristol Myers Squibb for $74 billion. I mentioned Sana before, and they're raising $700 million. They'll spend much of that money to develop the company's platform, which is designed to repair and control genes in cells or replace any cell in the body. Uh, also funding preclinical and early clinical studies for multiple drug candidates and building out its manufacturing uh, capabilities and expanding uh, its staff. Alfara Pharma, formerly M3 Biotechnology, earlier this month they raised $85 million in Series B financing. They're developing a drug called MDX 1017 designed to restore brain function in people with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's diseases where it's planning a phase two, three trial. And uh, they're using technology, regenerative technology, that rebuilds connections between neurons, the, the technology that the CEO, Lean Kawas, developed while she earned her PhD in molecular pharmacology at Washington State University uh, a decade ago. Sonoma Biotherapeutics, uh, developer of regulatory T-cell therapies versus autoimmune and degenerative diseases, which include arthritis, inflammatory bowel disease, and MS. Along with ALS and Alzheimer's, they raised $40 million earlier this year in February in Series A financing. Uh, as we uh, wind down, uh, common strengths of San Diego and Seattle, uh, here's some things I've seen. One is experience. The leaders have track records of building successful regional life science clusters. Another is collaboration, a long history of it between industry, academia, and institutions. And the third is endurance. Both regions have years of growth and uh, they have managed to bounce back uh, from significant setbacks over time. Uh, thank you for taking the time to watch and listen. Let's stay in touch. Thanks, Alex. That's a lot of really great information. And um, yeah, so I'm gonna ask uh, the, the uh, speakers from each of the clusters to basically give a snapshot about what their experience has been and um, maybe some thoughts about New York City because several of you have experience here. So Joe, why don't we start with you um, from California? Thank you, Nancy. Good morning, everyone. Alex, thank you for a great presentation. I learned things about San Diego, actually that I did not know from your presentation, uh -huh. uh, which is great because I've been here for 32 years and I learn new things about our life science cluster every time I hear a presentation about it. Um, and that goes with the fact that, uh, as you said, Alex, our cluster is, is 40 years old. Um, I'm a, I am a New Yorker, uh, a transplant out here to the West Coast. Uh, I've learned to calm down a little bit. People told me when I came out here, I was a little intense, but uh, I've, I've chilled as a, as a Californian, Nancy. So. Uh, I'll, I'll be a lot calmer than I would be if I were back in, in, in New York with, with you all. Um, so uh, just a few thoughts. Uh, life science clusters uh, don't typically come about because someone reads a Michael Porter paper and decides that they're going to create a life science cluster. Uh, but uh, of course, we all respect Michael Porter and we studied Michael Porter and all the time that I've been here at BioCon. Um, I came here in 1988 to join one of our first protein expression companies, a company called Mycogen Corporation. Uh, we built that company and, uh, and sold it, as many of the companies historically in San Diego uh, have, have done, um, uh, to a larger company, to the Dow Chemical Company. Uh, our company still exists here in, the San, in, in San Diego in the form of uh, a company that's called Phoenix that uh, continues to use our protein expression technology that we developed way back in 1983. Um, the cluster here in San Diego is certainly the result of the creation of the serial entrepreneurs that came out of the Howard Berndorf, Ivor Royston origin, origination of, of, of Hybertech back in, in 1978. In fact, it's interesting, last week I was on the phone with Ivor Royston uh, and the week before I was on the phone with David Hale, who was the first uh, official CEO of Hybertech who was brought out here from, from Johnson & Johnson. Um, we're into our third generation of serial entrepreneurs here in San Diego. Uh, but this didn't all happen because Howard Berndorf and Ivor Royston created Hybertech. Um, and I think 
New York, this goes to, to the, the foundation that New York has. This all happened because of the creation of the strength of biomedical research here in San Diego, going back to the 60s, uh, when Jonas Salk was lured here by the city fathers uh, with the promise of building an institute on Torrey Pines Mesa overlooking the ocean, where he was able to attract people like Francis Crick, uh, who of course sequenced uh, DNA uh, with Watson and came here to be part of the institute. Uh, it, it came along with Roger Revelle uh, founding UC San Diego on the Mesa and UC San Diego with its focus on biomedical research, thereby creating researchers like, uh, like Harvard, uh, Ira Royston, who moved out of the university. In fact, uh, because of the fact that it was such a risky business at the time, Ivor tells me that he actually kept his tenure at the university in case he might need to go back when he created Hypertech because no one knew what was gonna happen with, with biotech here. Um, so you have that foundation. You have the city fathers zoning Torrey Pines Mesa for biomedical research. Uh, way back prior to Susan Golding uh, declaring the support for biotech, back in the 60s, the Mesa was zoned for biomedical research. In fact, um, it, to, today, uh, the, the Mesa in its strength of research institutions locates all those institutes within about a mile of each other uh, and, and, and of UCSD. So you've got to have that foundation and, and you've got to have that interface between uh, local government and, and the research institutes and the industry to support its growth. And it goes to some very basic things. Uh, you know, uh, we, all, we all get engaged in very large policy issues every day. But uh, one of the things that I think uh, we learned here in San Diego early on was that it was important to ensure that we could facilitate the construction of life science facilities through uh, zoning that was sensitive to life science facilities, um, through transportation, through the availability of, of uh, basic water and power for, for biotech facilities. All those things are the important part of the foundation that you need to build on. Um, the venture capital came uh, along, but you know, if, if, uh, if you go to, to Alex's uh, points on the strength of a cluster, uh, about a billion dollars a year of venture capital comes to San Diego, but uh, very little of it comes because we have homegrown venture capital firms here. Most of that venture capital is raised because the technology uh, creates the draw from venture capital funders throughout the country and throughout the world as well. And the other thing that I think is important is that um, you don't necessarily have to have the strength of the workforce there to create the biotech uh, and biomed workforce. We, in fact, uh, have, have engaged in campaigns to draw people here uh, because of the lack of presence of an established uh, biopharmaceutical industry here. Um, we've had to create the workforce, the homegrown workforce, uh, and to attract people to be trained in the business of biotech, the regulatory affairs aspect of biotech, and of course, all the engineering and science that goes along with it as well. So you create those programs at your strong universities, uh, universities like, uh, like Columbia and, and NYU and others in the area uh, that, uh, that can train people to, to be a part of this industry. Thanks, Joe. Um, I especially appreciate your comments about um, the infrastructure that's needed to support the lab facilities, because that's a lot of what we've been focused on in New York right now. As you know, we have a very low vacancy rate. We do have some new projects that are coming online, but right now it's very hard for life science companies to find space. And so knowing that you guys kind of focused on that early on um, is a good lesson for New York City. Yeah, it, it was real estate, Nancy, I, I, I have to say that that uh, played such an integral role in establishing the life science industry here. Were, were it not for real estate focusing on life science, uh, we, we wouldn't be here. That's, that's music to our ears. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, David, you're from uh, Takeda, a large pharmaceutical company, but you weren't originally uh, with Takeda. You were with a smaller company. So can you tell us a little bit about your own experience and um, now as a pharmaceutical executive, you know, how do you think about expanding your operations or where you're going to put down uh, further operations? 
Sure, thank you. And thank you for, for including us in this, uh, this wonderful panel. So, you know, let me just start by saying, uh, like Joe, I'm an ex-New Yorker. I grew up, um, <laughs> grew up in Queens um, and also, you know, had the opportunity to, to live in New York City, Boston, San Francisco, and then found my way to San Diego now um, close to 20 years ago. Uh, I came to San Diego from the Bay Area as part of joining a startup company uh, that was founded on UC Berkeley technology. And they, the, the founders of the company decided to set up their operations in San Diego. Um, that company got acquired by Takeda in 2005. And that represented for Takeda, which is a very old and uh, of Japanese origin uh, pharmaceutical company, its first US acquisition on the, on the research side. And so from there in 2005, the Takeda site in San Diego has grown from about 85 people to 300 people. And a big part of that has been the integration of different biotech companies that Takeda has acquired over time. And these biotech companies were all started based on different university foundational IP. Um, one company was from UC San, Fran UC San Francisco and another company was from Rockefeller University in Manhattan. And these companies uh, found their way to San Diego, were integrated into Takeda, and Takeda is very much now a melting pot of diverse talent from all of these different sources. And I think that that's a really important um, part of the story. I will say that in 2005, when Takeda bought us, there were those who, who basically commented that, that pharma, and particularly Japanese pharma at the time, don't stay. And so, you know, it's really a testament to the, uh, the whole ecosystem that we now are looking 15 years later with um, Takeda having uh, simplified its research footprint so that it's present in, in Tokyo, in Boston and in San Diego. And you know that speaks volumes to the compelling story um, that Takeda has grown to appreciate of why it's, it needs to be present in the San Diego and the California ecosystem. And that's reflected in part by the, the talent base, by the vital startup companies, but then also the research institutions that, that Alex described. And all of those things, you know, make San Diego a place where Takeda feels it's important to be present. Great. It's very interesting that uh, the two of you are from New York City and that Rockefeller ended up in, uh, Rockefeller's company ended up in San Diego. We see a lot of that and we hear a lot of that, um, you know, from the New York City EDC, about the fact that there's no space for companies in New York and so we're losing them to other clusters. And so that's really a great example. Um, so Leslie, can you talk a little bit about the Washington area and Seattle in particular? And maybe your experience in other clusters. You spent a lot of time in North Carolina, right? Yes, I did. So again, Thank you for including me. It's a lot of fun to be part of panels like this. I wish we had so much more time because there's so many wonderful things we could delve into. Um, let me start by actually taking issue with one thing that Joe said, which is around the Michael Porter and you really, most clusters don't get going by an organized effort where you pay attention to all the details. I don't want to spend a lot of time on North Carolina. I'm here to talk about Seattle, but I would say that it is absolutely the epitome of the public-private partnership. And it started in the 1980s when the decision was made to create, the RTP was created in the late 50s, you know, around three major universities. 
that whole thing was built up. It did not exist. And then in terms of picking industries to focus on, there was absolutely a commitment made to biotech in 1984 when the North Carolina Biotechnology Center was created. Um, and in every aspect of cluster development, it's been a big public-private partnership with the, the most recent example being biomanufacturing, which started as a big effort in 2003. And if you follow North Carolina, they're adding new biomanufacturing facilities and expansions practically weekly. Um, in terms of Seattle, I would say we are, I've always thought, even before I arrived, when I was interviewing to come here four years ago and was being interviewed about my North Carolina experience, what I said is when I look, when I've talked to people, when I've looked and, and done my homework, what I see is an ecosystem that reminds me a lot, other than weather, of San Diego because of the presence of that incredible basic research foundation. It's a, Seattle is a huge art ecosystem with the U University of Washington, which typically leads the pack, always in the top two or three in terms of NIH funding, federal research funding to public universities. And then like San Diego, you see San Diego, which I'm old enough and a Californian to remember I didn't want to apply to UC San Diego because it was not in the 1970s. It was a new university and it was kind of, eh, it doesn't have anything. And now, Joe, do you know how many Nobel laureates are there right now? Last time I checked, there were about nine. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think uh, that that's probably about the case. We used to do a Nobel laureate dinner every year. Uh, and at that time, we had 12 here. It's incredible, right? And for me, it's just funny having watched it be a nothing to be the powerhouse. Well, UW is an incredible powerhouse and it is a powerhouse, not just in life sciences and medicine, but also as you can imagine in computer science. We are surrounded in South Lake Union in East Lake in a concentrated area. Seattle's kind of a, a small big city and there are literally dozens of leading research institutes throughout our state and probably 10 or 12 that are right around Seattle. And so as Alex went over a number of those, you've got Fred Hutch Institute for Systems Biology, two major infectious disease research institutes, the Allen Institute for Brain Science, and so on. The cluster here, I would say really, um, it, it's not that super well-organized ecosystem that you see in some other places. It has grown to be more connected and more pulled together, but I would say it reflects its genealogy, which is a group of incredible risk-taking scientists and physicians that started 60 years ago when you saw things like the first bone marrow transplant 50 years ago being done at Fred Hutch, Think about what it took to get to the point where you were doing the first successful bone marrow transplant. That was a lot of risk taking, a lot of, I'm sure, prior deaths, but keep on going. And then what do you end up with 40 years later, 50 years later, you've got the immunology that's the basis of a Juno that then gets acquired by a cell gene, which then gets acquired by BMS. Um, there's massive immunology in our area. Um, medical devices were, the, were kind of the birthplace to ultrasound, modern ultrasound. And if you look in Bothell, virtually all the major ultrasound players are located there. Philips has thousands of people there, Sonocyte, um, and, a, and a bunch of others. Um, so the concentration in, in med tech as well as biotech. We are alike in that a lot of company startups and a lot of venture capital from outside of the region. So like San Diego, we typically have over a billion dollars of venture capital every year. And if you look kind of annually, if you take out the big, a $9 billion acquisition out of the picture, you still are at two to $3 billion of transactions every year in our region. Um, the collaborations that take place 
between our industry and the research institutes is strong. Most of our, most of our companies are homegrown. We didn't have, San Diego now has a number of big pharmas that have based their um, over time. Uh, Joe and I were talking about it recently. We have BMS here, Bristol Myers Squibb, and we're thrilled. We have many other big pharmas that have collaborations in our area, but we really don't turn out a big base of commercial talent um, because we haven't had. We didn't, we didn't start up because we had an Eli Lilly or we had a, a Roche in our area. We started up with a lot of little companies coming out of these research institutes, the Hutch and UW being particular in that regard. Um, fortunately, Steve Gillis from Arch was one of the co-founders of Immunex. So a lot of our history where it's hypertech in San Diego, Immunex gave rise to a ton of startup companies. And you've got Arch and Fraser, two of the leading major investors that now have most of their base of operation in the Bay Area, but Steve Gillis is still here. And if you look at those incredible companies, the Saunas and the Sonomas and the uh, Junos to begin with, it's a lot of set of common investors and they bring in the funding from other parts of the company when their names are associated with the deal. We have some Government support, it's not at all like North Carolina where there was tremendous, tremendous desire and engagement in economic development. We're not a big economic development state in some ways because we haven't had the same needs. We've got huge tech, um, Microsoft and Amazon both being corporately based here. They are the epicenter of cloud computing. Almost any major cloud computing company you can think of is based here in Seattle. Every time I walk by a building and I look up, I see another, another name of a household company in that regard. So the convergence of tech here, AI, machine learning, with our companies um, has been extraordinary. And then I would just end with social mission and what is driving the millennials here. And that is global health and a true focus on changing the world. So I, Terry has been here much longer than I have, Dr. Foy, and I wanted her to join me on this because I thought she could give more of a historical, how have things changed over the years? So I'm, I'm penting to you, Terry. Okay, got it. Thanks, I, thanks, Leslie. Even though I'm not the moderator. <laughs> thanks, Leslie. No, that was a really great um, over, overview of the, um, some of the strengths and, and uh, common threads for the Seattle scene. I'll, I'll just give a little bit of my background and then and tie some of those ideas together. So I, I came to Seattle uh, in 1995 to come work for a startup biotech company called uh, Carixa that Steve Gillis was starting after he left Immunex. And at that time, again, the biotech sector was just, just sort of burgeoning and um, it was a startup kind of high risk uh, company, one of the few at that time in the Seattle area. But it, it actually, I think, reflects kind of, as Leslie mentioned, how the region has built off of kind of a, a core set of individuals, at that time scientists or physicians, but some of them now have moved on to um, be venture capitalists and still continuing to seed companies and fund technology um, in, C in the Seattle area. Um, my experience is having started in a small uh, biotech company and then built uh, that, built with that company, grew with that company, and then started again with it, another small biotech company in Seattle. Again, drawing from innovation and technologies from people in the area and then funding uh, through venture capitalists as well as strategic investors um, from, from Big Pharma. Um, to seed companies based in Seattle. And I think the one thing that I would say has been the common thread is, is that people recognize that Seattle has a lot of talent, scientific talent, a lot of innovation, and people willing to take risks and um, you know, delve into areas of science that are new and bold and innovative. And even though it's not the most high profile place on the map, like Boston um, or San Francisco, 
people have invested in the science and the individuals who are committed to building those companies. And I think that's what has sustained the, the sector in Seattle through the ups and downs of the industry. Um, and I think, again, having people that, that sort of believe in that the location does make a difference because of the strength of the academic centers there, as were mentioned earlier, the strength of the, the um, commitment to global health, to oncology, to immunology, those are really key scientific areas that have been continued to be built up through both academic research as well as <clears throat> the companies and the industries that, that have, um, or the, the industry companies that have committed to it. And I'll just say from speaking from having gone through a couple of small biotech companies, then getting more exposure to the large pharmaceutical companies through acquisition of those companies, I've learned over the last few years, you know, what the pharmaceutical industry is looking for when they're partnering or when they're investing in smaller companies. Um, and, and I can speak firsthand on the experience with Celgene. So I, I helped build the Seattle Celgene site uh, about six years ago. And a couple of the reasons that Seattle was chosen for that site to, to invest and put people there to build that site from scratch for our immuno-oncology research center was, um, as we just said, the academic strength of the academic institutions there, the strength of the small biotech companies there, and the, the strength of the scientists in the area. And uh, Celgene invested at that time in building that center there and has leveraged that model of um, committing resources in different regions for their research centers. Again, with the idea that innovation happens in a lot of different places and you can leverage talent, people resources, um, intellectual property resources, academic institutions, they don't all have to be centralized. And that was a big tenant of Celgene's research uh, strategy. And now we've moved that same uh, philosophy into the BMS uh, research strategy. And BMS is doing the same thing, is committing to these research centers in different cities, not just the big ones, not just New Jersey and not just um, Boston or San Francisco, but other areas where there is a lot of talent, there's a lot of innovation. And maintaining that in um, these regional centers is really critical. And I think it's, um, it's reflected again in, in what's happened in Seattle and, and the companies that we not only have, have partnered with, but invested in either through um, uh, uh, strategic investments or through direct partnerships and, um, and acquisitions like the, the one that we did with Gino. Um, so I'll, I'll pause. There. I think you raised a, a point that we had talked about on the pre-call also, which is, what we're seeing is a real trend are these companies that have employees are not forcing people to move to one big centralized place. Mm -hmm. Those days, if they weren't gone before, probably now in the COVID, post-COVID world, I don't think we're going to see a lot of pushing people to move into big consolidated centers. So many of our companies, mm -hmm. interestingly, there are a core group of scientists in Boston and in the Bay Area and in Seattle, and as Joe pointed out, there were some in Seattle as what well, I mean in San Diego as mm -hmm. well, where the company is made up of a constellation of leaders in those three areas, and they're building out their own capabilities there and then linking them all together. And that seems to be where a lot of the big money is going. It's mm -hmm. not in small bets. It's bringing together these co cohorts, these not cohorts, but coalitions of mm -hmm. Of scientific strength and exactly. we'll see it more and more and sauna is a perfect example of that mm -hmm. and I, I just should mention that that Celgene has um, a, a center of excellence a research center in San Diego as well and it was for the exact same reason it came through an acquisition of a small company but the Celgene at the time decided to maintain their presence there because of the talent there because of the innovation and the opportunity to kind of build um, maintain and build on the original um, you know, cluster that was there. So I, I really think that is the model of the future. I think consolidation into one place, it, it, the, you know, it, it doesn't help um, with the diversity of thinking. It doesn't, you know, you need the diversity of thought. You need the diversity of expertise, leveraging the regional um, cancer centers, the regional institutions, all I think add a lot of value for 
the way that you can um, you know, leverage your scientific network. I think, I think there's an additional contribution to, and, and we saw this early on with um, some of the first pharmas to establish a presence in San Diego. Um, you know, uh, obviously uh, larger companies like Takeda uh, have uh, strengths on the upper end of the, of the pipeline that biotech companies don't. And, and biotech companies tend to uh, attract people and establish cultures that are uh, a little bit uh, more flexible than the larger pharma companies. And, and I mean, I've been, on, I've been on both sides. I've worked for large companies and I've worked for, for, for uh, biotech companies. And you see this uh, in, in a, a strong cluster like San Diego, where we have uh, probably 10 large pharmas you see this great uh, interchange, uh, this interaction of folks uh, being attracted into the pharma company. Uh, many of the people who David attracts into Takeda who come from biotech, uh, who come from David's background, who have that uh, experience in a, in a more uh, uh, flexible, more creative culture to come and seed the, the pharma culture. And you have the folks who go to the pharma culture and really learn how to, how to manage better, manage a business better uh, with a little bit more discipline who go back and, uh, and, and help to grow biotech companies and to start biotech companies. So uh, beyond the science, uh, there's, there's this, this, this great dynamic uh, that we enjoy uh, because of the strengths of those two different types of, of, of biomedical uh, uh, institutions. How much, I wonder, does the move, uh, I believe it was uh, uh, either, uh, Terry uh, who, who spoke of having not consolidated centers, but centers in many different markets, uh, regions. How much is that a virtue of necessity, the fact that maybe a, star, a rock star researcher would not want to move to another region, or they have their lab in the place, or they're tied to a university where they're drawing talent, where uh, what's now turned out to be something great started out with because usually you know bigger businesses try to consolidate and we've seen that in so many under industries and even mm -hmm. to a degree in, in in the pharma and bio mm -hmm. pharma well i think that i think that is the, the the way of the future i think that originally i think there was a desire to bring people together thinking that it, it was necessary to be face to face for every interaction and and mm -hmm. you know be under one roof to make sure that there was alignment but the, the world has changed. We do so much of our business now through virtual interactions and there's, it's so easy to exchange information and, and share data um, that they're really, those barriers don't exist anymore to that. Um, so having, giving people the flexibility to maintain their current affiliations or their current personal situation, I think it just, it adds value. People, you know, res, you know, appreciate that there's a, um, you know, respect for their, their own individual needs as well as their professional needs. And, and I think it just, it, it shows, you know, the, sort of the, the thinking of a kind of greater good. It's not all about, you know, the, the top having control and dictating where everybody lives or sits or, you know, interacts. Um, and I, again, I think it just adds to, you know, the, the mutual diversity and respect that people have one for, for each other if you're allowed to have some of that independence um, in your own, either your own center or your own city as part of a bigger company. Um, and certainly that, that model worked very well with Celgene and, and I think BMS now is embracing it quite well too. Whereas historically that was kind of against their grain. I think they're, they're becoming open-minded to the fact that it can, it can really work well and you can see the benefits of it as opposed to the, to the downside. Nancy, did you want to talk about New York? Yeah, so I, as I'm listening to you, it's really interesting to me because we've seen a huge expansion of the tech companies here in the last couple of years. So Google is um, building a million square foot plus campus just a few blocks from where I am right now. We've seen Amazon and uh, Apple take substantial footprints in the city. And um, I know Facebook is, is looking for one as well. Um, so it seems like they are kind of looking to establish bi-coastal tech operations. And that could be very, very good news for us. 
um, especially since a lot of these companies have been investing very heavily in digital health technologies, which is, you know, kind of the wave of the future. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's, that's a really good point. The other thing that Terry said in terms of, you know, decentralized operations, I think could benefit New York as well, um, because we have lots and lots of small companies that are growing now here. And, um, and so I think if they were to become part of a larger operation, as some are, we have seen the, for example, the acquisition of Petra Pharma just recently, um, and they have a small operation in New York, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see if that get, gets expanded or not. But I think that um, maybe that kind of focus on decentralization will stem the loss of some of the startup companies that we've been experiencing, you know, that drain of companies and talent over the last few years. So, um, so I'm encouraged by both of those things. But I'm also, you know, I'm very bullish on uh, life sciences in New York City. I think we've reached a threshold um, and that we now have an acceleration which is, um, which is increasing rapidly. And I think the next five years, you're going to see a lot of development in New York. In five years, uh, this market's going to look very different than it does now. I think one of the things, Nancy, that I, I, I wouldn't discount, though, is uh, the, 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 the growth in incubation facilities. Um, it's not all about decentralization. Um, it's also about uh, small companies having the ability to interact with each other. Uh, and, um, and, you know, there was a time here in San Diego, as David knows, um, because he's been here for 20 years, um, that we didn't have a single biotech incubator here in San Diego. Uh, and today uh, we've got uh, probably at least 10 that uh, allow small companies to have access to integrated facilities with uh, the resources that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to have access to within their own small facility or if they were operating remotely uh, and the ability to partner with each other if they have, uh, if they have technologies that are compatible with each other as well. So uh, these incubators are springing up every day uh, the young people who are founding these companies out of the universities uh, enjoy the culture of being in an incubation facility. Uh, one that we just moved uh, some of our folks into called Grad Labs here in San Diego uh, has a uh, amenities uh, center with a, a happy hour twice a week and a cafeteria where people can go and uh, if they have lunch, they have to sit down and, and talk with others in the, in the cafeteria. Uh, it, it's got... Uh, it, uniquely San Diego uh, surfboard wash down room down in the basement <laughs> um, and, a, and a bike, a bike uh, parking spaces as well. Um, so I, I think, I think you, have, you have to also in New York uh, pay attention to what's happening uh, in the way of the creation of incubators and the kind of culture that, uh, that we see in those incubators that didn't exist here years ago. Yeah, so the yeah. New York City EDC has really focused on creating a series of incubators here in the city. And we have seven now, and SOSV is establishing an operation here. Um, they, have, they have an interim operation, and they'll be establishing a permanent operation shortly. Uh, that is a critical component, and I will be highlighting Biolabs at NYU Langone, which is one of those incubators. During COVID, um, they accepted eight new companies into their facility and five of their companies landed substantial financing during that period. So this is going to be a very strong growth catalyst for the New York marketplace. And I think that you're absolutely right. Um, those attributes are really important. We've got a few questions from the audience. So let me bring um, those in and, and give them a chance to get part of the operate, uh, the discussion. The first one is from uh, Jason at Pavarini McGovern, which is a construction management firm in New York City. He says, we are re repositioning a building for King Street properties into an InnoLabs facility right now in Long Island City with a mix of renovation and horizontal expansion. 
With building repositioning all the rage these days, as well as offering savings over new ground up construction, are the panelists in other cities seeing building repositioning for life sciences projects? You know, let me make a comment. We um, uh, certainly seeing it um, because of the fact that we've pretty much run out of space on, uh, on Torrey Pines Mesa. Uh, and so what we're beginning to see is some repositioning in other places, uh, including downtown San Diego, uh, where we've got a lot of uh, uh, tech presence. Uh, and um, we're seeing a lot of interest in, in uh, repositioning uh, buildings down there. UC San Diego is actually creating a downtown campus uh, we're, we're in the in the uh, in the midst of construction of a new trolley line from downtown to the UC San Diego campus up in uh, in Torrey Pines, and so I, I think uh, I think we're beginning to see some of that uh, that type of of, of activity uh, because of uh, out of necessity and also because of the fact that UC is is establishing a presence in, within the city of San Diego and because. A lot, a lot of um, younger people are living downtown as well now. No one used to live in downtown San Diego, but uh, not not no one. I shouldn't say that, but yeah. um, you know, it wasn't a there, there wasn't a lot of of, uh, of availability downtown. But we're we're seeing that growth now because and and you know that says a lot about uh, uh, places like Long Island City in New York as well. Yeah. A lot of repositioning in New York uh, City. Uh, we've seen, for example, Deerfield management by 345 Park Avenue South uh, in Manhattan, and that's going to be repositioned into a life sciences uh, building. Uh, in Chicago, again, more closer, the uh, former Takeda US headquarters is going to be Horizon Therapeutics. So that'll be, again, repositioning, but within the same kind of use uh, as, as uh, to the uses in Manhattan, where a lot of older buildings, uh, where you have property owners, managers, and, and, and landlords, developers, looking at the life sciences as a use that can draw uh, a new breed of, of user and really put in some value uh, to these older properties. Whereas you know corporate uses and others have shrunken over the years, and if anything, there's less of those concentrations. Uh, among just simple, straight, big office uh, or, or, or big manufacturing, at least in, in New York. But uh, we're definitely uh, seeing uh, that. And I think New York's a prime example uh, of repositioning, but it does exist elsewhere. David, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, no, I was, you know, what I was going to say is when we built our, our a few things, that, you know, when we built our new facility, which was 165,000 square feet, you know, one of the first questions that we asked was, could we move out and would we see a meaningful discount? And the reality is, is that the developers and, and our landlord is, is Alexandria, um, there was no benefit for a discount because in fact, there was a greater willingness to invest close in in the, in the cluster. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw that out that, um, you know, you have that complexity and, and uh, you know, my, my mom taught at Long Island City High School. I know, you know, these, these dynamics. I will say that San Diego, I can drive and get anywhere in 10 minutes. Um, and when you think about, you know, exactly where you're located, it makes the, the stress um, much, much lower, but, you know, to, you know, the thoughts of the places that you could go in Long Island City, in, in New York. Um, and I've experienced this in Boston where to go from Cambridge to South San Francisco, South San Diego, um, South Boston, it takes you an hour. So, um, you know, I think there's a really interesting dynamic that makes New York a little bit more complicated. And, you know, the classic, commentary about San Diego and the classic commentary about San Francisco that I can tell you is companies are located where management wants them to be because it's where management wants to live. And so when you think about that relocation in New York City, um, the question is, is where does management want that to be? 
and where where do you need to have it for the collisions? Yeah. So here's another question. Can you discuss startups needing mid-sized labs and pilot labs and how to help them stay in state? Or do you have statistics on how many of these companies move out to keep growing? Statistics, no, but there is a gap between the, uh, the startup one or two person space and, and, and an incubator and where they go in between them sort of graduating and maxing out that space and where they can uh, rent out their own space. So I guess accelerator space becomes a big need as a result uh, of that. And there's some efforts. You see a lot of that in, in, in the Boston area with the growth, uh, for example, sake of, of Lab Central, but uh, there are other examples uh, elsewhere as well. One of one of the things we've seen quite a bit of is longer, um, longer nurturing of startup companies in the environment in which they were founded. So the Hutch has done a tremendous job of that, where they keep these companies, they start them up, they kind of operate them in stealth mode, and they provide a lot of support services there at the campus. Similarly, UW has Comotion. And while there's never enough, believe me, for as fast as the ecosystem is growing, this is, I think anyone that has a serious life science cluster struggles with this issue. But I think increasingly you're gonna see the sources of the IP contribute more to taking the company a step further so that when they're ready to launch, they're, they're further along. They're past that baby stage. Terry, do you, is that yeah. your perception? Uh, yeah, I would agree. And also, I think the VCs are funding larger first, you know, Series A investments, bigger dollars, so that for the same reason, because the model, you know, 20 years ago of just giving a little bit of money to get you to the next step, it didn't work very well because you kept kind of trickling in money and you're always operating on a too lean of a budget. And whether that's space or people or other IP that you needed, I think, I think investors realize that it's better to invest a larger amount yep. right away and, and allow the companies to, to, you know, incubate and grow without having to worry about how are they going to make their, get their next. A hundred percent agree. And there's so much more money there. I mean, those of us that started in biotech in the nineties, I went to work for a company that went public with an $8 million round. I mean, <laughs> it was mind blowing then. It was so bad, but now it's just, it, it's inconceivable. Yeah. So looking at a hundred million dollar round, these early stages where they're tranching and uh, moving along. And again, just like the connections among the scientists, the connections among the money. We've got a lot of seasoned talent out there across the board. Um, so it's, a, it's very different environment than it was 10 or 20 years ago that's for sure yeah i think when you when you look at um when you look at companies uh i guess the question was are companies uh growing uh out of where they're being established um you know first of all venture capital uh, is put to work in a much different way than it was when uh venture capital invested in, in our company in the 80s or or, or even in the 90s um, in fact, I can remember to going going to some facilities um, in San Diego and in other places where they had incredible artwork outside uh, and, and inside, and in these incredible facilities that they right. Remember Leslie? Oh my uh, God, the North, we've got a few legendary stories from North Carolina on that. Oh yeah. So while real estate is still important, I think uh, I, I think what we're seeing is that, uh, and, and to Terry's point as well. Uh, and yours, uh, Leslie, companies are nurtured farther along, uh, but they tend to take more advantage of uh, the, the kinds of support services that they can access in clinical research and, uh, and, and consulting to grow rather than to focus, uh, and I can see David shaking his head too, focus their, their money on investing in, in bigger buildings. Well, I mean, I think, you know, we have to pay attention to outsourcing. And so, you know, you see more and more companies where the internal head, they may have a lot of money raised, but the internal headcount's actually pretty small. 
and the leverage paradigm is 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 really outside. And then you know, COVID nineteen is really added further lessons about diversifying where you're going to do that work so um you can keep keep moving operations forward yeah so we've got a question about covid 19 um following up on that and this this will be our last question because i, I do want to give everybody time to network for a little while um this question in the wake of covid 19 how do the panelists see the real estate needs and demands of these life science companies, particularly the incubators Joe was just speaking of, who historically enjoyed collaborative type spaces with shared facilities, changing or not, particularly in densely populated cities like New York? Wow. Okay, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I, I think, one, our industry, we're essential, right? People are essential workers. So our life science companies are continuing to go to work and are in their labs. Terry can speak to, of course, non-essential people are not at work and people who are at work are, the companies have been incredible in terms of how they have reorganized their facilities to be safe. But our industry is exploding, right? The amount of, the amount of uh, growth that is being caused by COVID right now as people are trying to keep up their regular programs and turn to applying their technologies into COVID-19. If anything, there's just tremendous growth. In that startup mode, the idea are people not still, if you need a lab, you need a lab, or you're just not going to move forward. How you're gonna secure that lab is gonna depend on what the individual facilities have, how they're able to organize that space to be safe. Um, but I, I don't know how much would actually change because you got to do the research. I, agree. I, I would agree. And if anything, I, I, I would say it may encourage even more of that collaborative you know, space use. I think our, um, as Leslie points out, our industry is, is critical, but also they're educated, right? And so I think that our industry, Amen. as well as healthcare industry in general, know how to uh, practice safety measures. And I would not have concerns necessarily about companies sharing space. And again, if anything, given all of the, the changes that people have had to be more flexible and, and some people working remotely or working in different um, environments and conditions, I think we've realized that flexibility is important and a flexible workspace if it allows you to keep working or it allows your company which might be in financial you know hardship to continue to work if you're sharing a space i think i think that that will increase if anything um our industry you know being open to doing that kind of thing covid 19 has been a wake-up call yeah uh, We'll we'll tackle COVID nineteen. I'm I'm certain with with the just the the and, and Takeda's working on it as well. The the, the multiple uh, efforts to develop the diagnostics and the vaccines and the antibodies. We'll we'll tackle COVID nineteen. Uh, what we need to tackle is the is is the whole area of pandemic disease coming in the future and uh, more funding of anti infectives uh, and the, and the whole the, the technology around uh, understanding. Uh, infectious agents as well uh, because um, while while we've been essential and uh, and our employees in life science have been working uh, we we certainly don't want to have to go through this every two or three years amen to that <laughs> so you know let, let me share with you i've heard two very interesting res kind of responses to covid 19. so one one response i've heard was that we need to have more square footage so we have more spacious collaboration space as opposed to cubes. And then on the flip side, I've, I've heard that we should, people are gonna work from home, we don't need to come in. And so therefore we're gonna convert the buildings to take away common space and just claim and have a higher density of lab space. So it goes in completely opposite directions. And you know, I mean, my, my, my personal view is we're kind of in, the first quarter of COVID-19 and the world will be different. And I don't think we've engineered the best way for the world to be different. And I think that 
there's there's a work from home element that I think is going to be there. And then I think there is this um, the desire to have collisions, you know, will still be there. And we're going to have to figure out how to balance those two, plus the fact that real estate is a very expensive um, piece. And for startup companies, you're trying to manage those expenses. So, I, you know, the answer is I don't think we know, um, but we need to adapt. Right. Great. Great. Well, thank you everyone for sharing your perspectives. I know the audience has learned a great deal from you. I have, I know. Um, and I'm actually reassured that we're on the right direction. So thank you for sharing your um, experiences. You're all welcome to stay. We're gonna go into discussion rooms now. So if you wanna stay and, and speak with every, anyone in the audience, please feel free to. Um, but I know you've all got busy schedules, so I want to be um, respectful of that. So thanks again.